Welcome to the Audio Digest of the American Journal of Psychiatry. This is Michael Roy with highlights from the June 2008 issue. During this program, we'll present a clinical case conference that describes the use of deep brain stimulation performed after a cingulotomy had provided only short-term benefit. We'll also feature comments of Dr. Stuart Yudovsky from his editorial that discusses changing tides in neurosurgical interventions for treatment-resistant depression. Then, we'll highlight a report by Ronald Kessler and colleagues on the economic impact of mental disorders in the United States due to the effects of these illnesses on earnings. We'll also feature an imaging study of the amygdala in adolescents with disruptive behavior disorders who also exhibit callous and unemotional traits. An editorial that explains the role of callous and unemotional traits in research on antisocial behavior will also be featured. Then we'll present a direct comparison of atomoxetine and methylphenidate for treating attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Our final article describes a large French study that links greater memory impairment to a longer history of past depression. We'll begin with the Clinical Case Conference. It is by Joseph Niemott and colleagues, entitled, Neural Stimulation Successfully Treats Depression in Patients with Prior Ablative Singulotomy. The case offered a unique opportunity to compare the two procedures in the same patient. We begin with the patient history. Ms. A was a 55-year-old woman with a history of refractory depression dating from age nine. She had feelings of misery and somatic complaints that included low energy and muscle tension. She reported a constant sensation of heaviness, which she described as being a black cloud that surrounded her. She experienced a remission between the ages of 36 and 48 while taking bupropion. After that, however, she became incapacitated by severe depression. Trials of numerous antidepressants and adjunctive medications did not provide sustained improvement. Ms. A also underwent eight bilateral ECT treatments, but experienced no benefit. The case was reviewed in a multidisciplinary conference, and Ms. A was deemed a good candidate both for singulotomy and for a trial of deep brain stimulation. She chose a lesional singulotomy. The procedure was a bilateral stereotactic ablative singulotomy. Over the next two months, Ms. A's score on the 17-item Hamilton Depression Rating Scale declined from 22 to 5. The remission was sustained for six months, but then she experienced a full recurrence of her symptoms. Eight months after the surgery, her Hamilton score had returned to 19. An MRI confirmed that the lesions from the previous singulotomy were appropriate in size and location, and so a repeat singulotomy was not considered promising. At that time, the facility had just completed a pilot study of deep brain stimulation of the CG25 region for refractory depression. After neuropsychiatric testing and discussion with Ms. A's psychiatrist, the multidisciplinary conference recommended deep brain stimulation on the basis of compassionate use. During the placement of the electrode, when her brain was stimulated, Ms. A reported that her feeling of being in a black cloud was alleviated. She also expressed immediate interest in returning to activities she had avoided since her relapse. This effect was contact-specific and reversible. Stimulation was begun on the day after surgery. The positive and negative effective scale was administered to determine the most effective contacts. The stimulation settings were adjusted slightly over the next several months to maximize response. Ms. A again experienced a remission of her symptoms. Her Hamilton score was 11 after three months, and after six months, it was eight. Her activity level increased, and she was able to resume volunteer work, similar to what had occurred after her singulotomy. 30 months after implantation, the remission was maintained, and her Hamilton score was 7. The authors go on to review the research on these two procedures for major depression. In one study of singulotomy, the efficacy rate was 31%, which represents a considerable success in a population resistant to all modes of pharmacologic therapy and to ECT. However, the response in this study correlated with activity in the thalamus and in a part of the cingulate gyrus that was not immediately adjacent to the ablated fibers. Therefore, the treatment may work by disrupting part of a more complex network. Functional neuroimaging studies implicate the subgenual cingulate in major depression, so this region was targeted in a pilot study of bilateral deep brain stimulation at the author's institution. Four of six patients improved substantially, and they had reductions of at least 50% in their scores on the Hamilton scale. In his editorial, in which he comments on these procedures, Stuart Yudovsky calls attention to the struggle psychiatrists face with a trade-off between therapeutic adventurism and clinical abandonment, pointing to the results of the STAR-D trial, where even after four sequential trials of medication change, augmentation, and combination strategies, approximately half of the patients did not achieve remission. The patient in this case may be the only person who has ever been treated with both singulotomy and deep brain stimulation 
for depressive symptoms. But Dr. Yudovsky states that any consideration of these procedures must begin, and often will end, with the history of the controversial practice of lobotomy in the United States between the 1930s and 1970s. By the 1990s, the practice of neurosurgical treatments for neuropsychiatric disorders, as well as innovation in the field, had slowed almost to a standstill in the United States and Canada. Advances in functional and structural brain imaging have increased understanding of the brain structures and pathways involved in depression. Advances in technology have also led to newer, safer, and more effective devices and ways of delivering treatment, such as the improved electrodes used for deep brain stimulation. Thus, novel neurosurgical interventions for treatment-resistant depression and other neuropsychiatric conditions are being refined, and their uses appear to be on the rebound. One issue that this case illuminates is the problem of determining the outcome and safety of invasive procedures. Unlike new drugs, which require study before the Food and Drug Administration approves them for marketing, cingulotomy and deep brain stimulation can be practiced as long as hospital care committees approve them. Niemott and colleagues used the outcome of this single case to argue for deep brain stimulation, a reversible procedure, over cingulotomy, which is irreversible. Although this logic seems eminently reasonable, single case examples are also a limited source of information. Large, double-blind, placebo-controlled case series are obviously not possible or desirable for highly invasive procedures, but scientifically rigorous methods for collecting and assessing both failed and successful outcomes are needed. Dr. Yudovsky concludes that the field must be ever vigilant for the trade-offs that most assuredly will accompany increased applications of neurosurgical interventions for intractable neuropsychiatric disorders. Special attention must be devoted to predicting, preventing, and identifying side effects and complications. For example, a high rate of suicide has been detected in patients treated with deep brain stimulation. This observation gave rise to the recommendation that patients be carefully assessed for suicide risk before undergoing surgery and that postoperatively, they be monitored carefully for suicidal ideation and intent. Lobotomy's history of inexcusable professional excesses and undeniable harm to many patients calls for ethical safeguards. Special emphasis must be placed on elucidating and eliminating conflicts of interest among the researchers and clinicians who advocate, recommend, or administer neurosurgical treatments of neuropsychiatric disorders. Now we turn to the article by Ronald Kessler and colleagues, entitled Individual and Societal Effects of Mental Disorders on Earnings in the United States, results from the National Comorbidity Survey replication. This survey gathered information from a nationally representative U.S. sample between 2001 and 2003. The assessment of earnings included approximately 5,000 respondents between the ages of 18 and 64. DSM-IV disorders were determined by using the composite international diagnostic interview. The disorders were distinguished by severity, and the highest classification was serious mental illness. This included severe and persistent mental illness, plus a suicide attempt with serious lethality intent, an impulse control disorder with repeated serious violence, or any other disorder that resulted in 30 or more days in which the respondent could not carry out daily activities as usual during the preceding year. The respondents were asked to report their individual earnings from wages, but not other types of income, over the past 12 months. Control variables were included in the analysis for sociodemographic variables known to predict earnings, and an inflation factor was added to account for fringe benefits. Because the distribution of earnings in the U.S. population is highly skewed, the authors used generalized linear models in the analysis. The best-fitting model specification was used to determine the effects of serious mental illness on 12-month earnings. Serious mental illness was associated with significantly reduced odds of having any earnings relative to respondents without serious mental illness. And among those with any earnings, serious mental illness was associated with lower earnings. These relationships were found for both men and women. The difference between the average expected annual earnings of respondents and the observed earnings for those with serious mental illness was more than $16,000. For men, this estimate was more than $26,000, whereas for women, it was $9,300. Three-fourths of the overall decrement in earnings associated with serious mental illness was due to the lower earnings of those with any earnings. The earnings estimates were averaged across all respondents with serious mental illness. This average was then multiplied by the estimated prevalence of serious mental illness and the size of the non-institutionalized U.S. population between the ages of 18 and 64. This nationwide estimate of lost earnings due to serious mental illness was $193 billion, 
This is more than the economic stimulus payments currently being sent to taxpayers. Comparative studies show that the magnitude is also higher than the earnings loss from most non-psychiatric illnesses. Perhaps the most significant limitation of this study was the inability to adjust for the reciprocal effect of low earnings on the risk of mental disorder. There is good reason to believe that such an effect exists. Therefore, while it can be stated that serious mental illness is associated with low earnings, it is not known how much of this association is due to serious mental illness causing low earnings. Next, we'll highlight the study by Abigail Marsh and colleagues entitled Reduced Amygdala Response to Fearful Expressions in Children and Adolescents with Callous, Unemotional Traits and Disruptive Behavior Disorders. Callous and unemotional traits include low empathy and emotional responding, and they increase the risk of deleterious outcomes in juveniles with disruptive behavioral disorders. Imaging studies implicate abnormal activation of the amygdala and abnormal processing of emotional facial expressions in adults with these traits. Marsh and colleagues examined brain dysfunction related to callous and unemotional traits in adolescents. These traits correlate with measures of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Therefore, the study included two comparison groups, 12 adolescents with ADHD and 12 healthy adolescents. The index group comprised 12 adolescents with callous and unemotional traits in addition to either conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder. The presence of callous and unemotional traits was determined with the antisocial process screening device and the psychopathy checklist, youth version. The severity of these traits was measured with the youth psychopathic traits inventory. The participants were shown pictures of neutral faces and faces with emotional expressions, either fearful or angry. The emotional expressions were shown with varying degrees of intensity. These pictures were projected onto a mirror in an MRI scanner and brain activation was measured by means of functional MRI. The subjects were asked to indicate the gender of each face by pressing buttons. Activation of the amygdala in response to the fearful expressions was calculated as the difference between the reactions to the neutral and fearful conditions. The healthy subjects showed greater activation than the adolescents with callous and unemotional traits. Those with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder also had more amygdala activation than the callous unemotional group, but the difference fell short of significance. There was no difference between the ADHD and healthy subjects. Activation of the amygdala did not occur in response to the angry faces in any of the three groups. Previous work suggested the connectivity between the amygdala and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex plays a role in the processing of fearful expressions and in callous and unemotional traits. In this study, the correlation between activity in the right amygdala and in the right ventromedial prefrontal cortex was stronger for the healthy adolescents than for the adolescents with callous and unemotional traits. Also, within the callous unemotional group, the magnitude of this connectivity correlated negatively with the total score on the youth psychopathic traits inventory. These findings suggest that the processing of emotional expressions is associated with weaker functional connectivity between the amygdala and ventromedial prefrontal cortex in youths with callous unemotional traits than in adolescents without such traits. The amygdala is believed to play an important role in response to emotional expressions related to distress, such as fear. It also appears to play a role in socialization. Children with callous and unemotional traits have impaired processing of the distress cues that guide healthy children away from antisocial behavior. Amygdala dysfunction may represent the locus of the impairment in processing distress cues and thereby underlie socialization problems. Animal studies indicate that the ventromedial prefrontal cortex uses input acquired from the amygdala to guide behavioral response. Thus, connectivity of the two regions is important for appropriate behavioral selection. Impairments in this connectivity may be associated with the antisocial behavior seen in children and adolescents with callous unemotional traits. These traits may represent instrumental behavior that is inappropriately modulated by stimuli such as others' distress cues. In support of this interpretation, the amygdala and proximal regions of the ventromedial prefrontal cortex have been implicated in reasoning about moral and immoral behaviors. Marae Dolan provides background for the study in her editorial, Neurobiological Disturbances in Callous Unemotional Youths. She begins by reviewing the research on risk factors for antisocial behavior. Disruptive behavior disorders, including conduct disorder, are found in a heterogeneous group of young people with varying risk of persistent antisocial behavior. Early attempts at delineating a more homogeneous subgroup of high-risk youths focused on identifying symptoms associated with ADHD. Comorbidity between conduct disorder and ADHD is associated with more persistent antisocial behavior.
However, this antisocial behavior is related to higher levels of conduct problems rather than to the specific influence of ADHD symptoms. In addition, the presence of comorbid ADHD symptoms does not seem to designate a subgroup of conduct disorder with unique cognitive and affective deficits that result in antisocial behavior. Recently, there has been growing interest in the construct of psychopathy as an alternative to ADHD for subtyping antisocial youths. Psychopathy is a complex personality disorder that includes interpersonal and affective traits, as well as behavioral characteristics. There has been debate on the number of dimensions needed to capture the construct of psychopathy in adults. However, research in antisocial young people has highlighted a potentially useful distinction between the impulsive conduct problem dimension and callous and unemotional traits, such as lack of empathy or remorse. Youths with high levels of impulsivity and conduct problems, but low levels of callous and unemotional traits, tend to engage in reactive rather than instrumental aggression. They also show high levels of emotional reactivity to threat or distress from others. By contrast, those with prominent callous and unemotional traits seem to have a unique temperamental style, characterized by fearlessness and thrill-seeking. Their behavior is relatively stable and is associated with a more severe and persistent pattern of antisocial behavior. Genetics, cognitive skills, and emotional information processing have also been examined, and these studies provide evidence that callous unemotional traits are associated with a unique neurobiological developmental trajectory toward persistent antisocial behavior. Callous and unemotional traits are highly heritable compared with impulsive conduct problem traits. They are thought to be specifically associated with deficits in the processing of negative emotional stimuli, particularly fear and distress in others. These deficits may impair socialization. The brain circuitry that connects the amygdala and ventromedial prefrontal cortex is implicated in the processing of emotional information, and it has been suggested that amygdala dysfunction may be associated with callous unemotional traits in psychopathy. A number of functional MRI studies in adult psychopaths confirm the hypothesis regarding amygdala dysfunction, but there have been no similar studies in younger cohorts until the work of Marsh and colleagues. This is the first functional MRI report supporting the notion that amygdala dysfunction may be a key etiological factor in understanding callous unemotional traits, and that the severity of these traits may reflect reduced connectivity between the amygdala and the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. The work shows the potential utility of fMRI in advancing our neuroscientific knowledge about the developmental nature of disorders such as psychopathy and ADHD. By focusing on relationships between the brain and behavior, rather than discrete psychiatric disorders, we can gain better insights into potential symptom-targeted treatments that may be applicable across a range of disorders. Complex traits and behaviors are mediated by anatomically interconnected neural circuits with gray and white matter components. Therefore, Future studies need to look at both the structural and the functional neural correlates of key traits, symptoms, or behaviors. By studying callous and unemotional traits earlier in life, it is more likely that we can develop more effective prevention and intervention efforts based on a sound and coherent theoretical causal basis. Much more work is needed on the role of genetic and environmental influences on the development of callous unemotional traits and antisocial behavior, and imaging genomics may offer promise. Given the societal burden of psychopathy and the suggestion that callous and unemotional traits may influence treatment outcome, it is important that future studies take a more dimensional approach to understanding the role of these traits in antisocial behavior. Now, we'll highlight a treatment study of ADHD by Jeffrey Newcorn and colleagues, atomoxetine, an osmotically released methylphenidate for the treatment of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, acute comparison, and differential response. The study included a crossover segment to examine whether some patients respond preferentially to one drug or the other. Earlier head-to-head -head comparisons of these medications had important limitations. This study was placebo-controlled and double-blind, had more than 500 patients, and used osmotically released methylphenidate, which is now the most common in the United States. The children in the study were 6 to 16 years old. The primary efficacy measure was the ADHD rating scale. Response was defined as a decrease from baseline of 40% or more in the total score at week 6. The children were randomly assigned to atomoxetine, methylphenidate, or placebo. The initial daily dose of atomoxetine was 0.8 mg per kilogram of weight, which could be increased to 1.8 mg. Osmotically released methylphenidate began at a dose of 18 mg per day, with increases to 54 mg. After six weeks of treatment, 
the proportion of responders was 24% for placebo, 45% for atomoxetine, and 56% for osmotically released methylphenidate. Both active drugs had significantly higher response rates than placebo. In addition, methylphenidate was superior to atomoxetine. There were no significant differences between groups in rates of study completion, which ranged from 77 to 84%. The rate of discontinuation due to adverse events was 2 or 3% for all groups. The only event that was significantly different from placebo for both drugs was decreased appetite. Insomnia was more common among patients assigned to methylphenidate than among those taking placebo or atomoxetine. Somnolence was reported more often for atomoxetine. Both drugs were associated with modest increases in cardiovascular tone. The increases in heart rate were greater for atomoxetine than for methylphenidate, perhaps reflecting the twice-daily dosing for atomoxetine. Both drugs were also associated with greater weight loss than placebo, an effect that was greater for methylphenidate. Neither drug was associated with treatment-emergent suicidal ideation. However, concerns about the potential for increased suicidality related to medications for ADHD have been raised and have recently been added to the product labeling for atomoxetine. Also, the number of subjects in the study was based primarily on detecting differences in efficacy, not safety, and it is possible that infrequently occurring events could have been missed. After the initial six-week comparison, the subjects assigned to methylphenidate were switched under double-blind conditions to atomoxetine for another six weeks. The response rates in this second trial indicate that some patients respond preferentially. Of the patients who had not responded to methylphenidate in the first trial, 43% subsequently responded to atomoxetine. Of those who did not respond to atomoxetine, 42% had previously responded to methylphenidate. This finding is consistent with practice guidelines that recommend changing to a different class of medication if there is poor response to, or tolerance of, the first agent used. For our final article, we'll turn to Philip Gorewood and colleagues, who discuss toxic effects of depression on brain function, impairment of delayed recall, and the cumulative length of depressive disorder in a large sample of depressed outpatients. Delayed recall was used as a proxy measure of hippocampal functioning because it is particularly related to the integrity of the hippocampus, and it was more feasible for wide-scale testing. Approximately 5,000 physicians in France were contacted by mail. They were asked to administer a test of delayed recall to at least one depressed patient before and after treatment with an antidepressant medication. The patient had to have a diagnosis of major depressive disorder, and the two memory tests were to be administered at least four weeks apart. The memory test was the delayed paragraph recall index from the revised version of the Wexler Memory Scale. Different stories were read at the two visits by the physician. After hearing the story, the patient was asked to repeat it using as many of the same words as he or she could recall from memory. One point was given for each verbatim response or acceptable alternative. After at least a 10-minute delay, the subject was asked to recall the story again. Each story contained 25 identified elements, and the patient's score was the number of elements recalled after the delay. More than 8,000 patients were included in the analysis. 70% were women, and the average age was 48. About half were experiencing their first episode of depression. At the second visit, three-fourths no longer met the criteria for a major depressive episode. At the first visit, the mean number of correct answers in the test of delayed recall was 10. At the second visit, the average number correct was 12. Several sociodemographic and clinical characteristics correlated with the score at the first visit. Structural equation modeling was performed to account for the existence of different clusters of variables. It showed that the largest effect on delayed recall at the first visit was due to a cluster of mood-related variables. Age and education had smaller effects, and a cluster containing the length and number of past depressive episodes had no effect. At the second visit, after antidepressant treatment, the cluster representing depressive history did correlate with the score for delayed recall. On the other hand, the mood-related variables no longer showed an association. Linear regression analysis indicated that the three most important variables correlated with delayed recall were visit number, number of past episodes, and the interaction between these two characteristics. However, age, education, and profession were also significantly correlated. Thus, when the patients were first treated for depression, current illness severity was an important determinant of performance, while the intensity of previous depressive history was not. After clinical response, the intensity of previous depressive history was more significant than current symptoms. Age, education level, and profession had significant impact regardless of the subsample and stage of testing.
The study is uniquely large. It therefore permits generalization of conclusions pertaining to memory function. These were proposed previously, but were based on much smaller and more intensively studied samples of patients, many of whom were more severely ill. The findings support the hypothesis that the intensity of past depression contributes to the impairment of memory performance when patients are recovered. This effect was most notable in younger patients, and it is difficult to determine whether this is because the reporting of previous depression is more accurate among younger patients or because other factors are more significant in older patients. The effects of illness intensity were also differentiated in patients who showed the most complete clinical response. The contribution in partial responders or chronically depressed individuals may be greater, but this is difficult to estimate because they are always confounded by ongoing symptoms of depression. A limitation of this study is that the delayed recall was assessed by informed but untrained clinicians. The Wexler Paragraph Recall Index belongs to a package that usually requires specific training, and the quality of assessment is important, especially for depressed patients in whom motivation and concentration are decreased. On the other hand, the clinicians were unbiased and indifferent to the primary hypothesis, which are advantages. Moreover, the impact of trait markers of depression on delayed memory was large enough to be detected even in an informal clinical setting. This concludes the audio highlights of the June issue of the American Journal of Psychiatry. We invite you to visit our website, ajp.psychiatryonline.org, for the full text of these and other articles. We also welcome comments regarding this audio. They can be emailed to Jane Weaver. Her email address is jweaver at psych.org. Thank you.